Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Ansgar. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about scaling, but I want to start first just with a, a very quick apology. In case you were here to hear about multidimensional resource pricing, uh, I had a bit of a hard time to make up my mind which of the two talks I wanted to give. So for a while on the website, both titles uh, were on there. So if you're really into multidimensional resource pricing, which you should be, um, I can only recommend, uh, I gave a talk earlier this year um, about it in the Ethereum context, which um, is, is quite interesting, I think. And then also um, with EIP 4844, we are about to introduce a, there, there's an open PR to, to, to update the fee market there. And hopefully, fingers crossed, this will be the very first time that we start uh, moving to multidimensional resource pricing in practice on Ethereum, like in this case, two-dimensional. So do have a look. Um, but today here, uh, I'll talk about scaling and specifically um, um, roll-ups, why roll-ups. Um, I first want to uh, talk more and more, more in, uh, on the theoretical side. Why really is our roll-ups so fundamental to scaling? And then um, bring it back and, and talk about uh, Ethereum's uh, future place in that world, basically. Um, so first, why, why roll-ups? Um, uh, and, and, and I want to start by uh, with, with something that I call execution chains. It's basically just blockchains as you know them. So uh, Bitcoin, of course, was the very first ever um, special purpose um, execution chain. Uh, special purpose just because it's only for payments and, and, and money. Uh, Ethereum, the very first uh, general purpose execution chain. And in general, uh, all these chains, of course, they want to have maximum functionality, maximum throughput. Um, but that, that's a tension with needing to guarantee security and, and decentralization. And, and to illustrate that kind of the tension, um, I, I created this little uh, fun little graph. So basically, uh, on the, on the, on the uh, x-axis, you have the cost to run a full node. And on the y-axis, you have the, the throughput that your network can have. Um, and with Bitcoin and Ethereum, basically, uh, you are in this nice zone where uh, down there, where basically everyone who wants to can run their own chain locally. Uh, I don't run my own Bitcoin chain, right? I occasionally use Bitcoin, but I could. Uh, it's just a trust trade-off that I'm, uh, I choose to make. Um, but that does mean that these chains are fundamentally limited in throughput, right? By by uh, the, basically the minimum uh, consumer hardware uh, capabilities. And, and kind of the, the key insight here really is that like everyone validating everyone's transaction doesn't scale. But of course, we, we, we don't want to give up you know, security by, by kind of moving beyond this. So like the very first thing you could do, and uh, I, I picked Solana just as an example, and this is not meant as a slide at all. Actually, I think uh, in, in a second you'll, you'll uh, kind of see how in a way they're kind of moving in, a, in an interesting direction here, but, but basically what, what they're doing, what they, their version of scaling is just to basically go further up this diagonal. Um, and that does give you higher throughput, but of course it means that now running a full node is, is, becomes really expensive. So that's one way of just increasing uh, a, a throughput. The problem is, what if you don't run your own full node and there's some sort of disagreement, right? Some, some malicious attack, some, some uh, chain fork. Uh, you only have two choices. Either you go with a majority, in which case 51% of the network can always rewrite all the rules, take away your money, everything, right? Or the other, the other thing you can, of course, do is halt and recover via the social layer, but that's um, very slow, of course. So where do we want to end up uh, on that graph? That's basically this, uh, what, what I call the unicorn zone up there, where um, everyone could you know, trustlessly validate the network, but we still have like really high throughput. Um, so how, how, how can we basically find a way to, to, to get there? Um, and, and that's basically where, where roll-ups come in. And why do roll-ups come in there? Um, to explain that, uh, as you might be aware, you probably are aware, there are like two different flavors of roll-ups, uh, optimistic and ZK roll-ups. The easier to explain in this context is optimistic roll-ups. So uh, to talk, basically to, to, to kind of get an intuition for, for how optimistic roll-ups solve this, this kind of this dilemma here, um, we can look, look again at the, at the Solana case. And, and as I was talking about, right, if if, if there's a disagreement, and even if you don't run your own full node, you always have the, have, have the option to just halt and recover via the social layer. And the optimistic roll-up kind of idea here is, what if we could just massively speed that up, right? Instead of running that kind of um, this, this fallback mechanism on human brains, where whenever something goes wrong, you have to actually go on Twitter and whatnot, what if we basically just automate that, right? Like we replace the human brain with, uh, with software, 
um, and in particular with with fraud proofs, and and um, and that's how you how you get uh, optimistic rollups. So, kind of tr trying to keep with my little picture sim uh, symbolism. So so the optimistic rollups are also basically a form of of an execution chain. They are their own blockchains basically. Um, the way they work is that they apply the changes optimistically. Um, and anyone can submit a fraud proof. Uh, so, so the only basically the only guarantee you need is that there's someone in the system that n notices if something goes wrong. But a one of n honesty assumption is a way, way, way less severe restriction than a majority honesty assumption. Um, and then these frauds they are automatically resolved on some sort of settlement platform. Um, yeah, th th that you need. And then the, the alternative, as I was saying, zk rollups. They are just crypt cryptographic magic, right? So, so in that case, you don't have to to, to do this retroactive um, fixing of problems. Instead, you you just uh, have any s state update come with a cryptographic proof that no one did anything wrong. And again, you need some sort of settlement platform um, where you can where you can resolve this. Um, one more uh, little caveat here uh, is that um, basically with rollups, we're moving away from this world where like. Everyone needs to run their own like full node to ensure integrity, right? Like I could basically only follow the settlement chain um, and still basically have all the guarantees about the rollup. Um, but one additional uh, thing thing to to ensure is that we have to also pay attention to data. If you run your own full node for a chain, data is implied, right? Because you actually download all the data and execute it locally. But with rollups, you don't do that anymore. So now we basically need explicit data availability mechanisms, um, and and that's what I put this little kind of database symbol there. Um, yeah, and, and, and with that basically, once you have, you have like ex an explicit settlement system and you have an explicit data availability system, now basically you, you, you can break out of this, of this kind of graph of, 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 um, of this um, full node uh, versus throughput um, uh, basically trade-off. And, uh, and how can you actually use this now to kind of to, to build Full blockchain systems. Um, that's kind of what the what the second part is about. Like, how, how do you actually turn this into into something useful? Um, and this is going to be very picture heavy because I kind of I don't know. It, for me, it's mostly about giving good intuitions here um, for like I don't know my mental models around this. Basically, that was that was my my motivation for the talk. Um, so again, this is like an execution chain. I drew a little box around it. It's basically in its own box there. It has its own security. Um, and that's, that's the world as it used to be, the blockchain world. We had a lot of these boxes like a couple of years ago, right? Uh, and now we're adding these exciting new tools um, to, to the picture. We are, we're adding settlement and we're adding data availability. Um, and how do, how do they basically change the picture? Well, first we kind of have to bundle them in some, or like we have to kind of put them into some useful form. Uh, the way we like to think about it is bundling them into what we call a settlement chain, which is its own blockchain there. You can see it has its own security. Uh, it's not the only way to do, uh, to do this. Like if you, for example, know Celestia, which uh, is a really, really in, in, interesting other um, kind of project that, that uh, basically works with similar kind of models. Um, they keep data and settlement separate. Um, but for us, uh, the, the, the way Ethereum kind of likes to approach these things is by, by combining them into, into a settlement chain. So now, so now we have these, these two separate chains. How do we basically now actually make use of them? Well, the, the, the way to do this is by, and that's what the arrows are for, by basically having, turning the execution chain into a rollup. Um, it kind of functions as, as it did before, but now it uses this, the settlement chain for, for, for data availability and for um, settlement. So you, it needs some sort of fraud proving mechanism or it needs some validity proofs attached. Uh, but other than that, it still feels like a normal blockchain, basically. Um, the simplest way to do this is what, what we call uh, like an enshrined rollup. So in that case, you'd have like one settlement chain and one rollup on top. And it's basically like a one-to-one like -on -one -one, um, relationship. And, and a very simple way you could imagine basically this process playing out uh, in the blockchain world is, um, and I, I guess that fits well into this kind of the multi-chain vision, would be where every, every blockchain that wants to basically go hyperscaling um, just adds their own little settlement uh, chain um, uh, underneath them. Um, and that, that would basically bring you to this, to this picture um, with m multiple different uh, blockchains um, they all, that would all now have their own settlement chain. The, the downside there is um, that, uh, for one, you have fractured security, right? Each, each uh, settlement chain has its own validator set or its own miners or its own however you, you get your security as your, as, as your chain. Um, uh, and, and it basically... Some, some of those will be higher security, some will be lower security, and that also affects bridges. Uh, I'm, maybe some of you have seen kind of Vitalik's write up a while ago about how basically if you bridge multiple chains, you always end up with the, the, weaker secu the weakest 
security of all of them, right? If you basically, if you want to use assets of like 10 different chains, <laughs> if the security of one of those breaks, like that specific asset just basically is, is, is broken for you, right? Uh, and if you have some sort of DeFi system where all of this is interconnected, basically everything can crash and burn. Um, you really don't want this minimum, the worst of all security kind of situations. And also, um, I guess that's less, less of a severe th thing, but also in, in this picture, you're kind of duplicating a lot of complexity um, for, for, for each chain. So what would be an alternative vision? How do we think the future might look like? Uh, that's what we what we call like a, a shared a settlement chain. Uh, so in this case, you have one big settlement chain, um, and you can have multiple rollups on top. Of course, probably realistically, the future will look some sort like some sort of hybrid. You'll still have some blockchains that prefer to do their own settlement chain, but but uh, we predict that like this will be a big chunk of it, basically, like a, a shared settlement chain. And why, why is that um, advantageous? Um, well, two main points really. Um, one is the shared security. Um, I like to think about it like shared pool security. It's not quite free security. Sometimes you hear people talk about how if you, if you turn your chain into a roll-up, you just get the, the security of the base chain for free. Uh, that's not quite right, I think, because actually if uh, you say you have 10 roll-ups on top of a settlement chain, then they basically all put ex additional strain on top of that settlement chain, right? Like now the incentive to attack the settlement chain is 10x as high. So you, you don't just get, like security doesn't just, you know, isn't, isn't just created for free, um, but it, it, it is pooled, right? So, so now basically you have to break the entire combined system instead of just being able to take the weakest link. Um, and what that also gives you is then because you have like one shared trust, um, uh, trust zone basically that all the bridges between those rollups, if implemented <laughs> perfectly, you know, <laughs> important caveat, um, it can, can, be, can be fully secure. Um, okay, so with that kind of Bringing it back to, to Ethereum, of course, I, I guess the last slide there heavily hinted to where we want to end up with, uh, at, but where, where, where were we in the past, where are we today, and how, how could we get to this shared uh, settlement layer future? So kind of starting with Ethereum a few years ago, uh, in, in the early days, basically, Ethereum also was a pure execution chain. We had uh, proof-of-work security, rollups weren't yet a thing. That was kind of a happy place to be in for, for a couple of years. Um, at some point, of course, like, Ethereum always wanted to figure out like how do we actually scale to billions of users. Uh, it took quite a while, quite a few years of iterations and, and inter iterations, just because I like kind of research archaeology and I, I would encourage you if you ever have some free time and nothing else to do, uh, go look at all research posts, it's always fun. So to basically just to illustrate that a little bit, I've like uh, picked like three that kind of accompanied our way kind of towards this, this rule-up vision. The first one is if you look April 2019, uh, it, it, it's, it's really quite amazing. KCD Trio, phase one and done, E2 as a data availability engine. Nowadays, I think these, this terminology, like everyone would just nod and be like, yeah, sure, thanks, sharding. But three and a half years ago, I think that was quite visionary. Um, then uh, a year later, a year and a half later, we had Vitalik for the first time kind of using this term roll-up centric uh, roadmap, where basically we, we finally realized that yes, there, there is no other way to scale. Like you really need this decoupling of, of the execution and the settlement. Otherwise, like you, you, you basically, as, as I was say, saying earlier, right? You, you can't break out of this uh, dilemma. So, so we really like roll-ups are the way to go here. Um, and then just a uh, third, just a, a fun little one. Um, that uh, my, my colleague uh, Matt um, uh, wrote a couple of weeks after Vitalik's post, um, looking back at our early E2 plans, and it, it actually turns out that uh, basically this, if, if you remember the early sharding plans, um, if I just go back a couple slides, if this works, uh, Actually, what we, what we were planning back, back in the day with all these different shards was kind of this picture all along, right? It was just that we wanted to have all these shards be like super enshrined um, and, and at some point enshrined roll-ups basically. And at some point we realized it's just much better if we open this up for, for general innovation, if we, if we don't build, basically if we are the only parties building roll-ups. Um, and so, yeah, this, this basically just, you know, is a little uh, history kind of tidbit. So, so this is kind of how we, how we got to where we wanted to move, move, move uh, forward with Ethereum. So that kind of brings us to, to the kind of the pre-merge state where we already started to use the Ethereum chain as a, as a settlement chain as well. But, of course, it still has execution. So it's like kind of like a hybrid chain. It's still proof of work security, of course, before the merge. Uh, and as I was saying, right, settlement chains need the, the settlement aspect, which you kind of get for free when you have a general purpose chain, but then you also need data availability. And 
data availability on the existing Ethereum chain is really quite expensive. It, it was never meant to provide data availability, so what, it's, it's kind of basically right now kind of hacked in. You just basically just dump data into, into Ethereum transactions and then never actually use them. Um, which works, but, but it's, it's just very, very um, expensive as a source of data availability. Uh, of course, we started having rollups on top. Um, really exciting, if you ask me. I think rollups have, have been making a lot of progress over the last two years. Um, and then, you know, pre merge, we had this, this beacon chain, <laughs> just an empty little box, nothing in it, um, but much stronger proof of, proof of stake security, right? And then, of course, um, as of today, we ended up, you know, merging. And uh, now we have, have this uh, basically same, same situation as before, but, but much, much higher security. Um, and just as a maybe quick aside, I, I, I think I have the time for that. Uh, why does proof of stake actually give higher security? I, always, I mean, it's not really kind of part of my talk, but just because I always see a little bit of confusion about that debate on Twitter, uh, I think it's, it's really quite, quite simple, actually. Like, um, the, the, the way I, I would think about like, moving from proof of work to proof of stake in terms of security, one, it's just more efficient, right? Uh, and that is because you don't, you, you basically, with mining, you actually have to pay for the entire cost of the operation. You have to reimburse miners for both the mining hardware and the energy, right? Like, they have to make all of that up with their income, whereas in proof of stake, you only have to make up the lost interest on your money. So, basically, you can get away with, with paying way fewer rewards for the, for the same security uh, in, 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 in proof of stake. Um, and then the other one it, is also that Proof of stake security is just fundamentally more effective. So that means that if there ever there were to be a failure, uh, which of course hopefully there will never be, but if there ever were to be like an attack or something, um, the attack is attributable, and so you can you can just you can go in and selectively punish people. In proof of work, once someone like an attacker has 51% of the resources, you basically just you know your chain is just lost, nothing nothing to be done. Uh, in proof of stake, it's really not a big deal actually, right? It's a little bit annoying for maybe a day, and then afterwards you're just done with it. Uh, so so that's really really uh, neat, I think. And then also like I couldn't couldn't quite help myself. Um, maybe this one uh, le le a bit more esoteric maybe, but um, uh, another quite interesting mechanism in terms of security that I really like is this um, ultrasound. Uh, money one, where basically the idea is when you have an, uh, uh, no more mining rewards, that means that we have uh, ETH as the asset has just much improved monetary properties, uh, which in the long run might, you know, might or might not turn into a higher expected monetary premium, higher total ETH market cap, and we can just buy more security in, in absolute uh, terms. But again, you know, this is more es esoteric, totally fine if you don't buy into this, that the first bullet point is, is the more important one here. Um, okay, so this is Ethereum today. Uh, where do we want to go? Uh, how do we actually get to this full, you know, shared settlement chain? Uh, how do we get full data availability? All of that kind of thing. So, uh, first thing uh, is next year, hopefully. Uh, fingers crossed. Um, looking good, I have to say. Uh, Prototype sharding, ERP4844, uh, that we've been really actively working on. Just earlier today, there was, there was, there was a session on this. Um, where basically uh, we, I, I don't know if you saw that, but like the data, pick, the data symbol there just become, became way bigger because you just, you know, you, you, you add better data availability uh, to the Ethereum chain. For the first time, data availability is an, is an explicit service we provide. It's not just something tucked on, but it's an explicit service, and so it's just more effective. Um, and then, of course, uh, you've, you've probably all heard about that, dunk sharding soon, TM, afterwards, uh, that could be two years from now, hopefully, like maybe, maybe it'll be three years, but, but soon. Um, uh, and, and that's really where we get like ultra scalable data. Um, and, 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 and with that, we will be for the, uh, basically, we'll be able to, to, um, to host multiple of these really high throughput rollups. So, so this is kind of, in terms of scalability, this is really the end game um, that, that, that we as, as Ethereum basically are, are, are aiming for. Um, and, and basically, kind of, with, with, with those pictures in mind, I kind of wanted to then, for the, for the last part, talk a little bit about where does this leave us? Like this, I, I hope that kind of gave, like intuition-wise, like a good idea of where, where we're moving and, and why, but, but what implications does that have? So the first, first thing I wanted to briefly talk about, what does it mean for the existing, well, ETH1, we used to call it ETH1 chain, like basically what now is just the execution chain within, within the beacon chain. What, what, what's the future of that? And um, there are basically multiple different 
um, potential future visions for it that you could, you, you, could, you could see. The first one would be that you, it basically stays this hybrid execution settlement chain or the roll-up settle on top of it, but also still, you know, it, it has some DeFi on it, whatever. For high-value transaction, it can still be used as an execution chain, so that would be kind of the default case. Um, then we, we, could, we could have the scenario where it really turns over time more and more primarily into a uh, pure settlement chain, so that means that really more and more of the user activity migrates to layer twos, and and layer one is really just t becoming more and more just a just a rollout management layer. And then the third one, it's more like a fun thought experiment. It's not really kind of planned or anything, but just wanted to kind of illustrate how this modular architecture really lends itself to to all these these, these different different ideas. What we could also do is that we could uh, in basically add an, an additional separate settle, pure settlement chain to, to the beacon chain and turn ETH1 basically into a, well, you would say, you could say a roll-up, right? So in, in this case, if you, if you look at that picture, you could just think of, you know, like one of those roll-ups being ETH1. So that's, again, I don't, I don't think that's likely that, that we'll go that way, but, you know, it, it would be almost, I don't want to say trivially, but it would be very feasible to, to, to go that route because we now uh, live in this in this in this mo uh, modular world. Um, uh, the, the other the other one I, uh, I briefly want to talk about was the the, the future of the EVM. So, um, what, first I I do want to say it is by no means certain that kind of the future of high throughput execution chains will be EVM based, right? Uh, I think Ethereum as the settlement layer will will always um, use the EVM. Uh, I think it's just good enough. Uh, for, for, for that, um, but it's it's not not yet decided. Like it could be that you know I don't know Solana or something has the the dominant uh, win, uh, winning high, highly scalable uh, VM um, uh, solution. It could could be could be the EVM. Could be some some of these other competing um, um, new ones. This is yet to be seen. I mean we are very optimistic for the EVM in in, it, in that um, scenario as well. And I think I do want to point out. Um, because that's sometimes misunderstood. Uh, the, the reason why Ethereum only has the limited throughput it has is not the EVM. That's not the, the limiting factor. It's really that we want to keep the resource requirements for validators low. The, mom, the moment you are a roll-up and you adopt the EVM, you can still go far beyond the throughput constraints of the base layer. And, so, and, and there are many possible EVM improvements that we just never bother to do, to do on the base layer because they're just not relevant for us but that layer twos are very actively looking into. So I think there's a very good chance that the EVM will turn out to be, to be like the winning or one of the winning um, high throughput uh, VMs. Um, yeah, and, and, uh, but, but of course, uh, whether like, like, like the, the outcome of, of, of all of this process will have like big impl implications, like clients, will clients basically say the existing EVM clients, will they be primarily settlement clients only or will they also be used for rollups? At some point, maybe they'll want to focus on rollups. Even um, how does it look like for, for programming languages for the EVM? Uh, what, what about tooling? All these kind of things, right? Um, so I think this is this is going to be like one of the the main interesting kind of technological debates of the next five years. Um, and in particular, I wanted to briefly, very briefly, talk about EVM equivalence because that's just a topic that I I personally am, am really interested in. So for these layer two layer twos, for these rollups that choose to go with the EVM. Um, the question is, do they go with the, 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 the exact EVM or do they just go with something that looks kind of like the EVM, right? And if you remember, say, Optimism, for example, they started out with what they called the Optimism, Optimi uh, Optimism Virtual Machine or something, OVM, which was basically an, an adapted version of the EVM, and now they're back at using basically the EVM as is. So the question is, in the long run, what, what is the way to go? Should you go with EVM equivalents or not? And so just briefly, basically, the, the pros that I see would be, of course, um, Standardization, right? Like if, if, uh, if you use the EVM, just all the tooling works out of the box. You have multiple existing client implementations, which again for security, having multiple clients is just really, really uh, helpful, but also really hard to achieve. So this is like a big win you can, you can get with EVM equivalents. Um, this, the, the, the third one is a bit more speculative, but we could definitely imagine in the future that we have some sort of specialized settlement um, functionality around EV, the EVM that, that we offer for rollups. Of course, that would not be monetary, right? If you want to run your own, uh, like Fuel or Solana or something on top of, of Ethereum, you can do that as well, but we would have special, uh, special support for, for these EVM-based ones. Uh, and one really interesting one, especially I think in the last few uh, months, people have more and more noticed how governance can really be a liability. Um, 
and if you actually follow the EVM as is, you can just defer to, to layer one um, uh, governance and follow their changes, basically. And then what are the, what are the cons? Um, um, uh, why might you not want that? Well, of course, one, it's just like if, you, if, you're, if you're stuck with the layer one EVM, that does come at a cost of slightly slower iteration speed, right? We have to really vet every change that goes into the EVM quite severely to make sure nothing ever breaks. Um, you might just need some layer two specific functionality. It's just harder to add that um, if you really don't want to, you know, kind of mess, mess with, with, with the EVM. Um, and also, and I feel like that's the, the one that's the most relevant in, in the context of my talk here, if we expect layer one and layer two to really operate at quite different uh, scales in terms of throughput, maybe having identical VMs is just not the, the ideal way to, 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 to go. And just as like a potential compromise here or having the best of both worlds idea to, uh, to, that I want to leave you with here is uh, one that I think might actually be quite exciting to explore in the future. Um, what if we could maybe get the best of both worlds by having a dedicated version of the EVM specs for layer twos that's still standardized across all the rollups that want, you know, to opt in, um, but is, is able to over time depart from layer one and, and really focus on, on optimized for the layer two case. So I think there's a good chance that we might end up in that world and, and, and I think that, that might actually, you know, um, be, the, be, be the best way to, to get us to, to, to high scalability. Um, and yeah, and I think, I hope, if I remember correctly, oh, I, I do have a summary slide, so uh, let me briefly go through that, but then, then, then we're done. So, you know, traditional uh, blockchains, you always have the, the trade-off between security and scalability, uh, roll-ups solve this, Ethereum's vision, we want to become the primary settlement chain. We're still at the very beginning of this transformation. Ethereum will likely, this, this is the last point, <laughs> I, I add the likely because who knows, right? But we, we do still, with the EVM, also have ambitions for, for execution chains. We do not just want to be, to be a settlement chain. Yeah, and with that, um, thanks. <laughs>